Okay, polymers are, as we know, really um, interesting, and then they're unique in many ways. I mean, there's there's unique um, as a material class. So the the stress strain behavior is similar to that of a metal in that it is linear elastic and then it deforms and has a peak and then the stress engineering stress decreases. Um, of course, what we see for a, a polymer is that you can get continued load bearing after necking, and that's unique. And we were able to explain that by understanding the microstructure of a polymer as being made up of all these great, great long um, molecules. And <clears throat> we said that following deformation, the molecules can become oriented with the loading axis so that we're stretching these primary bonds um, and there's more numerous uh, secondary interactions between the chains and um, so that that's uh, that's good this is a useful model this model is useful to us and in fact we can we can kind of further apply this this model and we can think about again these secondary interactions between chains in the in the molecule or in the polymer and we can think about the uh, this and as you think about a lot of salt I, I would think about this this competition, if you will, between um, between the binding energy or energy that's holding, whether it's an atom or a molecule, in this case it's a molecule, binding energy, and uh, so it's versus the, the thermal energy, these, these vibrations essentially. Okay, and so because a lot of the properties of a polymer are, are dictated by these these weak secondary interactions, we have to uh, realize that small changes in temperature leading to small changes in the thermal energy can actually significantly impact the um, the mechanical properties. So specifically, say, um, well, let me make this this uh, statement that polymers are sensitive to small changes in temperature but 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 especially in temperature that are close to room temperature okay so for a, a metal I mean small changes in temperature close to room temperature are inconsequential relative to the binding energy holding atoms in a metal in place, these strong metallic bonds uh, on an atom in a, in a lattice, and you know, these small changes. I mean, sure, you heat it up and you can melt it if you apply enough uh, thermal energy, but small changes are, don't make a difference. But for a polymer, a lot of these weak or secondary interactions lead to the property, so it's important. <clears throat> Whoops, that uh, just scrolled down there. I apologize. Let me scroll back up. Here we are. Um, <clears throat> so, so we can see uh, that small changes in temperature close to room temperature are important in, in a polymer and specific I can make it a little bit more concrete for you by sketching out a generalized stress strain curve for a polymer say uh, polymethyl methacrylate like an acrylic like plexiglass or something um, you know around room temperature 25 degrees C and then we say well what if you heated it uh, heated it up to I don't know 40 degrees or so <clears throat> so you might find that it becomes ex significantly more ductile and lower strength and also you notice that the elastic constant has changed the elastic constant has changed if we went to a lower temperature it would become stiffer and more brittle less plastic deformation and also the elastic constant has increased at lower temperatures. Um, oh, I didn't write in the temperatures. This would be, you know, maybe zero degrees C, for example, and say this was around 40 degrees C or something. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking generally. This is not, don't quote me on exactly what this looks like, but this is the trend that you'd notice for small changes in temperature close to room temperature for a lot of polymers. Um, the other thing that we need to consider in addition to temperature is the importance of of time okay time and so by time well another way that that's that's referred to is strain rate you know how quickly are you loading the sample strain rate um, that's often used that term strain rate for 
you know relatively rapid uh, strains uh, but also um, what if you load a sample for a long period of time days months uh, years well then polymers um, uh, the the viscoelastic nature of polymers becomes um, is significant so let's explore what that means and <clears throat> visco refers or the term it comes from the term viscous I guess viscous viscosity uh, which refers to the flow of a liquid okay flow of a liquid so we've got some component of the time depend uh, of the deformation that's that's time dependent and on another component the elastic that is what we would call instantaneous and let me explain that a little bit you know that's what we've discussed in the context of um, other materials like uh, metals and ceramics so we got a, a hook here it's supposed to be a hook okay that's a hook in case you it's a bad drawing and onto that hook I hang uh, a mass right well if I hang a mass on that I could um, go back in and and observe a, a change in that length there I right, could get a Delta L and, and calculate the strain if we hung that mass on there and we, this was a metal well there'd be some acceleration due to gravity so there's, there's a portion of time there but once it's achieved mechanical equilibrium that is once the load is is um, the, the forces are balanced then the strain that results from this load is instantaneous it doesn't change with time um, and so, so elastic deformation is, is the uh, instantaneous or time independent component of deformation so polymers have both a time dependent and an instantaneous com uh, component uh, dependent uh, of their uh, plastic deformation or of their, their deformation and we can further try to quantify that with a little sketch let's just say we took this this example here so we apply load leave it for a per uh, period of time and then uh, remove it all right so if we did that we have it sitting there and we apply a load to it and then remove it what would the load versus time curve look like uh, at some time we would apply the load and we would see that the load went up to whatever the force uh, would be that results from that mass close to the surface of the earth and then at another time we remove the load and uh, the force drops back down to zero straightforward okay um, so now that we've established that and I'll leave that on the screen there let's say we were to look at the strain now what's the strain that results so that is what's this you know Delta L over L naught for that material sorry let me move that back okay there we go so now we're gonna do this but we're gonna look at this for um, an elastic material something that was purely elastic and so what would that look like well we would have at the applied um, time this is time again um, we would have some instantaneous strain right elastic strain is instantaneous so and straight up at that time time independent it remains constant as a function of time and then at the moment that we remove the load it goes back down to zero what if we had something that was purely viscous okay on the other side of the spectrum here and we observed the uh, the strain versus time for something that's completely viscous this is like uh, you've got some honey on, uh, on on a table and you, and you tip the table you've got some you throw a coin into a pool of water and observe it settle down through the, the fluid through the water well what happens is at the instant that you apply the load that is you tip the table or that has the honey on its surface or you throw the coin into the water the instant that it hits the top of the water the coin is at the top of the water it hasn't yet accumulated any strain but then as a function of time it accumulates some strain 
or in the case of the honey on a table, the tab the honey flows down the surface of the table. And then at the, um, the time that the load is removed, that is you flatten the table back out again, the, the honey doesn't jump back up off the floor or, or, or sort of flow back suddenly up the table. It stays wherever it is. The coin doesn't float back up to the top of the water, even if you removed gravity. I mean, things would be a mess, but it wouldn't be, um, there would be no force causing it to move back up. So viscous is time, depend, um, time dependent. Once the load is removed, uh, the strain does not return. So that would be completely viscous. Now the question then is, what would it look like? What would this um, strain versus time curve look like for a viscoelastic material? And that's the case for all polymers really I mean to, to so different polymers can be more viscous or more elastic but they will all be to some extent viscoelastic um, and so what's it gonna look like well let's reason it out you're gonna have at the instant that you apply the load for a polymer you'll have some instantaneous uh, strain that is immediately there'll be some strain elastic then there'll be some time dependent strain that accumulates and then you can remove the load, okay, remove, and you get some instantaneous um, recovery, instantaneous recovery of the strain, and then some time-dependent recovery. And that will be the um, nature of the deformation for, uh, for, for, for all polymers. Again, the con contribution of viscous and elastic deformation depends on the polymer. Let me give you a, a more concrete example from everyday life just to uh, put this into some context. So again, we're trying to explain this curve here uh, with an everyday um, example. And so the, probably the best example I can think of is a carpeted floor. So this is the floor. That's, and that's a surface, right? So what's a carpet? Well, a carpet is not, nothing more than a bunch of um, fibers, often synthetic fibers, um, that are <clears throat> held in some backer, and they're, they're sort of standing up like little, little columns. And then what happens if you come along uh, to that carpet and you, know, you apply uh, some furniture? You put a heavy desk or something down on it. Well, as you probably know, the, the carpet is made to bend, um, around the, um, the, 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 the foot of that uh, table or desk, or whatever it is, right? There's a load that's being applied to that, so, so it deforms. And the, the question that, that uh, I want to address here and to show you the time-dependent deformation is what happens if you, um, when you remove that load, Okay, so what happens when you remove the load? So there you go, I've copied that over. And we remove the load. Well, the instant that you remove the load, there's there's still some there's some strain visible, isn't there? And a, a, if you take this to an extreme, to a longer period of time, you'll see even more time-dependent strain. Say you leave it there for a year, and you remove it. Well, the, the divot, that is the little low spot in your carpet, is quite pronounced. If you left it there for a short period of time, you wouldn't see that so much because there's less time-dependent strain because this is a polymer. This, this carpet is a polymer. Right? Even if it's a wool carpet, it's a natural polymer. It's still a polymer, and it has viscoelastic deformation, time-dependent deformation. Now, if you want to get rid of the divot, what do you do? You reverse the load. You reverse the load by vacuuming it. And eventually, if you're, if you're lucky and you're persistent enough, you can recover this time-dependent strain and get back down to zero strain where your carpet's sticking back up. So that's viscoelasticity. Um, and I uh, hope that helps.